Thank you. Uh, and our final panelist, before we start the q and I'm going to dive right into it, uh, is uh, Robert Woodson, who is the founder and president of the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, often referred to as the godfather of the movement to empower neighborhood-based organizations. And for more than four decades, he has promoted the principles of self-help and neighborhood empowerment and the importance of the institutions of a civil society. Mr. Woodson. Thank you. <clears throat> I, too, am in a minority on this panel. I was invited. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, I want to uh, take my time to address uh, our mission, and that is to talk about solutions. But I also want to be act as Amy's uh, agent, uh, just to compliment her. Usually in DC, when you have conferences, when the subject is race, most of it's patronizing, particularly two blacks as if we are a victim's class. <clears throat> and it's just refreshing to hear honest dialogue on the issues of race. Uh, something else, as a, as a former civil rights activist, having led demonstrations in the 60s, one of the things that, that bothered me, uh, at least concerned me with Dr. King, he said that the highest form of maturity is for anyone to be self-critical, the capacity to look into yourself, recognize where you're making mistakes, and then make, take corrective action. But my grassroots leaders say, if you want to do something you ain't ever done, and you want to go someplace you've ever been, do something you haven't done. Or as they say, if you keep doing what you do, you keep getting what you got. And in the civil rights movement, we've got to understand there are issues that are beyond civil rights, but we must be honest with ourselves. Frankly, what I've been calling for is uh, where it needs to be, a, in, in the black community, a moratorium on discussing what white folks have done to us. We have 150 black organizations that spend $3 billion every year coming to wealthy hotels complaining about what other folks are not doing for us. $3 billion. That needs to stop. We need an internal dialogue recognizing, as Moses realized, when you lead folks out of Egypt, it took him, it should have taken about a few weeks, but it took him 40 years because there was too much of Egypt in the Israelites. And so it is important, I think, as when we're looking at internal and external barriers to self-deliverance, we must recognize and confront external barriers. Yes, racism is, is a problem, but not the problem that it used to be. It is a problem that we must confront like any other barrier. But we must stop looking for other people to be deliverers of ourselves. We must deliver ourselves from whatever circumstance. The victimizer might have knocked you down, but if you wait for the victimizer to come pick you up, they need to take you to a mental institution. <laughs> and so what we have done at the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise is recognize on the issue of solutions that we believe that civil order, and that is peace and, and, and absence of violence, is a critical civil rights for anyone in this country. And there are some troubling questions that maybe this panel or others can raise, and that is why in the, since 1954, uh, there were 90,000 blacks in prison when we were 12 or 13 percent of the population. That was our percentage in the population. Today, that has grown to 900,000. Has racism gotten worse during that period? Are there other factors? Another troubling question we must address, why are black children failing in educational institutions run by their own people? So obviously, if race were the primary issue, then that question must be addressed. But what we do at the center is rather than spending our times debating these, we roll up our seeds and get to work. We must recognize that civil order is important and peace in order for children to have a good education, whether it's in a charter school, a private school, or a public school. There must be order. Most of the children going to our schools who are truant, who are absent from school, are fearful that they will, something will happen to them. In Washington, D.C., 12 Ten, uh, uh, sixth graders tried to commit suicide because they were bullied by the children. And so we have this high dropout rate, but yet education reform acts as if there's an, there is no violence in our schools. So what we do at the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise 
is that we recognize that uh, a lot of these, or, uh, these uh, societies where uh, communities where we have 70% out of birth, wedlock births, those dads are not coming back. So we've got to come up with alternatives for those kids. And what we do is recognize, I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I dropped out of school, and I have a GED. Why? Because my fellows, <laughs> seven of them, was one year older than me, and they graduated and left me unaffiliated. When you grow up in an inner city violent community, your group is more important than your family. If someone said to me, you can have your seven fellows over here or your, or your family, it wouldn't be a choice. I'll take my fellows because my nice, loving parents can't get me to and from school safely. But my fellows can. And recognizing that reality, what we have done at the center is that we looked into the community suffering the problem and said, what can we do with a resource? In other words, if you want to develop an anti-venom, uh, you take some of the venom from the snake, right, to create the, anti <laughs> the, the poison, the cure to the poison. We go into communities that are at risk and, and find out what are the capacities there. In my native Philadelphia, it used to be the youth gang capital of America. There were 48 gang deaths a year. They used to publish the Vietnam deaths right next to the gang deaths. It was an enterprising woman, Sister Fata, who I call a social entrepreneur. She and her husband recognized the oldest of her six sons was a gang member. And so she said to this boy, bring your friends home. I don't know anything about gangs, but I know something about family. So she sat these 15 boys down with her six sons, and they talked all night. She said, well, move in with me. She took out all of her furniture and put mattresses all over and said, if we have to live together, we have to cooperate, we have to be clean, we all have to work. She, and her, her husband, who was an uh, uh, old gangster, we call OG, negotiated with the local gang to let her, them come in. The long and short of it is this, this family thrived and within two years retired her mortgage and bought the house next door and the one next door to that. When the word went out that there was sanctuary within this community, there was a knock on her door. Within five years, it expanded to five houses and over 65 young men. She took what she had learned about reaching the hearts of young people, not through fear or intimidation or through a social program, but inspiring them by her example, by uh, 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 being a character coach and a moral mentor, and as a result, she said, well, I, if it works for us, why can't it work for the rest of the city? So she sent the word out, emissaries, to all the active gangs. And in 74, they had their first gang summit. That was the first year Philadelphia canceled the Mama's Day Parade. Because they said, if you bring all these crazies together, it's going to be chaos. Well, she brought them together, and it wasn't chaos. And, and, and as a result of this gang summit, Philadelphia went from 48 gang deaths down to two in one year, and it stayed that low. I came behind her as an activist academic and studied what she did for three years, and I wrote a book called A Summons to Life. And, and with that, it equipped me with the prism to go around the country and look for her counterpart in different cities, and I brought them and within the two years, I brought them together with the other young people who had been transformed and there was a second book called Youth Crime and Urban Policy, A View from the Inner City, where I listened to the young people whose lives had been touched and transformed. They are the experts, not these academics at Harvard. The, har the Harvards of this world can never solve the problems of the Harlems of this world. It must be incubated within the community suffering the problem. You must learn from the people who have suffered but who have transcended and transformed and overcome these difficulties they are the real experts. So the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, gathering this information, we form what we call now the violence-free zone. We now know what to look for in these cities. And so we now have in 38 schools in six cities, violence-free zone, where we go into the most violent uh, public schools. We work with a local operating partner, nonprofit, we help them to identify young men and women, some of them are former drug dealers, some of them are ex-prostitutes, 
Half of them are not. They just love the community. They share the same zip code with the kids experiencing the problem, both cultural and geographic zip code. They operate as hall monitors. They give their cell phone numbers to the kids. They're moral mentors. And as a consequence, we concentrate on 10% in any community, whether it's a school or a community. If you have 1,000 kids, they are influenced by 10%. And that 10%, 10%. So if you go in and you influence and transform a small number of people, you can change a whole community. Well, Baylor University has come behind us now and evaluated our violence-free zone in Milwaukee. We're in the city of Baltimore, Atlanta. We're in Dallas, Texas. And, uh, and, and we're in eight schools in Milwaukee. Milwaukee now is at a 25-year low in terms of violence because of the presence of eight no schools. We're able to reduce violence in the most dangerous school in the country by 25% in the first three months because coming to our youth advisors is not snitching. And so what we do is present surrogate parenting to these very troubled kids. And then these kids are then providing a, a, a safe conduct for their peers. And so what we have done is we, we're like the human body is oriented towards health. And the most, uh, uh, at the, so the least intrusive intervention is the most effective. So we look at these youth advisors as antibodies. And collectively, they represent an entire immune system. So we take resources, information, and inspiration and pump these through these, uh, uh, these systems, these immune systems. And now we have a prototype in 36 schools in six cities that we are now ready to take to the whole nation to demonstrate that when you build on the strengths of a, of a community by going to the people suffering the problem, and what we, the biggest struggle we have is going to professional people and funders, helping them to understand that with our college education comes a good dose of intellectual imperialism. We need to learn how to be on tap and not on top. And what the center does is come behind these grassroots leaders and recognize that they are the real experts. And the challenge when you're talking about reform is how to invert all of what we have done by taking the principles that work in our market economy and apply them to the social economy. In our, social, in our a commercial economy, only 3% in the commercial economy are entrepreneurs. They tend to be C students. C students. You see, uh, A students who are rich come back to the universities and teach. C students come back and endow. <laughs> and so we believe, because very smart people have to have all the answers before they make a decision. By that time they do make the decision, the opportunity is gone. <laughs> but C students are able to act in the presence of their doubts and uncertainties and make a decision. Our grassroots leaders that we work with who are able to accomplish these great things are our social entrepreneurs. And the challenge that we have as a nation, how do we grow them and take to scale like we do in our market economy? So we take something that's operating in someone's garage and make them a Fortune 500. We need to find a moral equivalent in the social economy to take a social entrepreneur that is successful in six places and expand it to 6,000 places.